The latest edition of This Racing Life is all about this special horse, a hero to many and a legend of the jumping game. Den, the big D, Denman. Or the tank, we'll be hearing about him and indeed Charlotte Alexander a little later on. But first, where it all began, that was down at Ditch It. Ollie Bell has been finding out more. Uh, Paul, we're just reflecting on the career, the life and times of Denman, if you like, and obviously you played such a, an important part, an integral part into his career. Uh, if we can just take it back to the start, when did you first come across Denman? Well, I was in point to point in Ireland. Uh, we went over for a weekend with Mr. and Mrs. Barber, Georgie and I, and Paul and Marianne, and we, we I think, for, if I remember rightly, um, yeah, I had a horse that was called William Woody uh, running in a point to point. And, I, think, I don't even know where it was, somewhere in Ireland, it was pouring with rain, the horse fell, and we were all sort of a bit fed up, and we were looking for something to do, and um, Paul said to me that he'd been offered a horse, Denman, for quite, it had been offered it several times, and uh, Adrian Maguire was at the point of point, it said, look, why don't you drop in, it's only 10 minutes away from here, and have a look at him. So we had nothing else to do, thought it was 10 minutes, so it was an hour and 10 minutes, as typical, um, and went to see Demon. I didn't know anything about the form or anything of what had done, Bar, Mr. Barber said he'd, he'd won his only point to point and he'd been hobdayed, and a couple of people had already looked at him, but didn't want him because he'd been hobdayed, and I just said, well, that won't matter, because that'll save you a thousand pound, haven't done in two years' time, because most of them end up being hobdayed, and didn't think any more of it. We got to Adrian's, and I remember now, he opened the door and pulled out this big, gorgeous horse, and I thought, wow, like him. Um, and Paul and I looked at each other and I said to Paul, I'll have him. He said, no, he won't, I'll have him. <laughs> and Paul just said then and there, that, yeah, he, he, he loved him. As long as I liked him, he'd buy him. And we agreed to deal with Adrian and went down, had a cup of tea and saw the video of him winning. And that was even more impressive. We sort of did ask about face really, but he was just such a super individual. So what I call my type of horse and Paul's type of horse as well, that we bought him. And what is that? What, what is your type well, of horse? Paul always said he likes a big scope. He also carried 12 stone and run in the Gold Cup one day. There was this huge, big horse. It was obviously going to carry 12 stone. Might have been useless for all we know, but he was just a proper horse. He came back here and was it immediate that that sort of striking appearance, that point to point form clicked or, or did it no, take it was a while? Interesting. He, he, took a, he was out in the field in the summer and got fat as a pig, came in like they do in the middle of July and was big and lazy, which he always was. He was very lazy around the roads, actually. He had to boot him around the roads. He was one of those horses It was either flat out on the gallops or was lazy as anything around the roads. And he didn't show a lot at home, to be honest with you. He, he, was, he, he took a while to get fit. Um, he was lazy jumping, lazy everything, but was a lovely big type of horse. And I remember having a conversation with Paul several times. Said, Paul wanted to go chasing with him straight away. And I said, look, let me just give him one hurdle race, just for A, for experience, because he's only had one run over fences. Um, and we'll see what we've got. And if he's too slow over hurdles, we'll go back chasing. So we turn up at Wincanton one October. You're not really knowing what we had, to be honest with you. Um, and I remember Christian Williams rode him. I think it was Christian rode him um, the first day. And um, he, he won by a head from a horse of Oliver Sherwood's. And that day he went past the stables, was looking into going to the stables and acting the boy as he did. But he, he won ahead and Christian said, you know, this is a really nice horse. So we were a bit surprised because he wasn't that fit and he hadn't shown a lot at home. Um, so we thought, well, we'll give him one more run over hurdles. And, and we went back to Wincanton for a, a race which we'd done quite well with other horses in the past. And he was a lot better, a lot fitter, and he won very, very nicely. And Christian turned in, gave him a slap, and he took off. And he actually got off then and said, this is the best horse I've ever sat on. So we thought, oh, we've got something here now. But that was all irrelevant. You know, we were looking forward to the day he went chasing. He was obviously going to be a chaser. And to be such a good novice hurdler was a, was a bonus. And at that stage, was that talent now being seen here at home? Uh, no, did you? never showed much at home. He really? was just working like And often the best horses are like that. You know, it was, you, you, what you've got to do is get them fit and let them, you know, show it on the track. Big Bucks is just the same. You never know what you've got at home till he runs on the track. Um, and Neptune Clonge was another one like it. The only one who was absolutely awesome horse working on, uh, on the track and at home was Corto. Um, a lot of the others don't show you much at home. So you, you know, if you know that, you just get, all you've got to do is get them fit. And that's interesting because you had Corto and Denman boxed mm. next to each other, both incredibly mm. talented. Yeah. Did you always think that Denman would reach the heights of Corto? Did you always think that they would be, <laughs> there would be that era that we all talk about as the Denman no, and Corto? No, not really. Era. I was lucky to have them both. And, you know, in the early days, Corto was obviously winning Tingle Creeks and over shorter distances. Mm. Denman was a stayer. But eventually, Corto was getting the trip. There was going to be a clash with them. Um, they mm. never, ever worked together at home because they would have been you know, 
Denman would have been a furlong behind Corto and a piece of work. That was just the way it was at home, but on the track they were obviously totally different. Was it an, was it an, an enjoyable and easy period for you as a trainer, or, or was it quite a, a tricky period because you've got two high-class horses that, that obviously you've got to map out seasons, map out paths for them through the year? Oh, obviously it's fantastic and privileged position to be having horses like that and awfully lucky to have them at the same time, but obviously there was plenty of headaches went with it, lots of stress, which there always is, but that, that's, that was a nice situation to be in. And, um, you know, they're wonderful horses and, you know, the likes I'll probably never have a game together, you know, they were just amazing. Have you been to see him recently? Have you, no, I haven't recently. Um, obviously, um, I keep updated all the time. Charlotte's always emailing me and, uh, and, and Paul and we keep an eye on, on what's going on. I'm looking forward to seeing him at Newbury. Um, he obviously, he's had lots of problems. Uh, he's been well documented. And obviously, for a while, we kept it quiet because we didn't want to panic anyone. And, and he was in a bad way all summer. And, you know, Paul has done a sterling job uh, giving him the best of everything. Didn't matter what it cost, Denman was having the best of everything. And I know Paul had some huge bills just to keep him right and keep him alive. And he, 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 Paul deserves a lot of credit for what he's done, and so does Charlotte. And it's fantastic he's now got over that and is, is looking, looking, looking an OK again. Well, Ollie also managed to catch up with Clifford Baker. When was the first time you, you saw Denman? Well, Denman came over, I think he was four when he came over originally. He, he, he was very outstanding to look at. Great big horse, um, as he won his point of point, so you know, he thought he'd be a nice horse. Um, didn't show us a lot at home to start with, um, and then he went to win Canton his first run and only just won, but then he just kept improving, improving, and improving. But he was a very striking horse to look at. What was he like at, at, at home to deal with? Was he quite relaxed and, and laid back? He wasn't, wasn't never particularly laid back, actually, in his early days, he was quite keen especially on the gallops. Um, I think Christian Williams used to ride him out quite a lot when he first arrived. But he would bite you or kick you. You know, he was that type. He had a bit of character about him, which, you know, which is good. The good horses have always got something about them. Could you tell... I know you said that when he came here, he was quite a striking individual, and it took a bit of time to sort of see that spot. But was, once, that sort of, once everything clicked, was it fairly apparent that he was going to take you to championship races? Oh, I think so, definitely. I mean, he's heard... He was a big horse and we always thought whatever he did over hurdles would be a bonus. And to be fair, as soon as he went and I was chasing, I think we knew straight away that he'd go to the top. And we always knew he'd be a Gold Cup horse rather than a champion chase horse. So yeah, we, as soon as he went chasing, we, we expected him to end up in a Gold Cup for sure. So everything he did in his hurdles career, he was a shallow hurdle winner, he was runner-up in his Supreme Novices, that was all even then a bonus to you guys? Absolutely right. And we, we always knew that. We always knew he was going to be a chaser I and mean, he was a great big horse. And he'd obviously won a point to point before he arrived. So, yeah, we knew he was going to be a chaser. And once he went chasing and once he stamped his authority in that division and you had Corto as well along the way, what was that period like for you and the team here at Ditcher? I, I mean, it was absolutely brilliant. And I think having the two made it even more interesting. Um, the great thing is that we didn't have to run them together to the Gold Cup because they were completely different horses and they went in different directions all the way to Cheltenham. And all their Cheltenham runs, I mean, I think they they ran three or four times together in Gold Cups with Denman winning, Corto winning, Denman being second. So it was a great era and I just was privileged to be part of it. Not just that, you were able to ride out Corto Star and occasionally get on Denman as well. So you were probably the best man to judge <laughs> where they were both ranked ahead of the Gold Cup. Yeah, it was quite nice. I was lucky enough to be able to ride them both. I mean, I could ride Corto work first lot and Denman second lot, or vice versa. So, yeah, I rode Denman quite a bit. I used to ride him work quite a lot. So I always knew what sort of shape he was in. But I think when it came to the Gold Cups, we were never really sure which one would finish in front of which one. But it was quite nice that they sort of rotated it a bit and one beat one and then the other beat the other. Because they had different characteristics as horses. They're different run styles. Uh, different different types. What were the weapons that Denman had in his armoury that, that stood him out? I think Denman's main was his jumping and the fact that he stayed well. I mean, that was his main two things. To win two Hennessy's, which is three mile, two and a half in soft ground off top weight. You've got to be a good jumper and a really good stayer. Um, Corto was probably a bit quicker, a bit sharper. That's why he probably won five King George's. Um, but he was able to win two Gold Cups as well. But Denman, I mean, that's what he was all about. He was all about jumping and staying. And how much of a credit to his willingness and attitude was it that he was able to overcome what was a pretty serious heart condition? Ah, oh, he was amazing, really, because, I mean, <clears throat> to go through what he went through, if you'd have seen him after he'd come back from having his heart sorted, 
I mean, he was he was a wreck for two months. So he did well to even run that year. And you think he went on and finished second in the Gold Cup. It was amazing. And then won a Hennessy after that. So, I mean, that shows how tough he was as well. Of all his performances, what to you was the one that stood out? I think he'd probably say the Gold Cup. But to be fair, it's probably one of his best performances was winning the Hennessy the second time after his heart problem, off, top, off a big, big weight, off a big handicap mark. That was probably his best performance ever. And when a horse like Denman, when a horse like Corto leaves the yard, how much of a, of a hole does it leave in, in the stable? Oh, it leaves a big hole, of course it does. Um, Denman and Corto basically more or less left at the same time within reason. So you, you're sort of having a double hole sort of thing. But yeah, we, we, we knew obviously one day that they would go on to do other things. Um, but I think we enjoyed them while they were here. And that's the most important thing. And Denman was a great part of that. How would you sum him up in five words? Uh, he was a superstar. Well, Ollie also managed to catch up with Lucinda Gould. Lucinda, you were an important part of Denman's life. You looked after him for a long time. When did you first get given the job of looking after the mighty Denman? Um, I took him on, actually, after he won the Cheltenham Gold Cup. Um, so 2008, that would have been in, when he came back in in July. Um, yeah, he, the, Jess, who used to look after him, she had finished that season to have a baby. So... Um, when Paul and Clifford asked me to look after him, I was quite gobsmacked. So it was a, a huge honour but and a massive pleasure. Well, is it quite in intimidating, as at last being told you were looking after the Gold Cup? I guess winner? in a way, yeah, particularly with his size and his uh, reputation as a bit of a brute, but actually he couldn't have been more, more of a gent. So. What was he like to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, he, he could make grumpy old faces and swish his tail and snap his teeth, but he, he knew where the line was, I always think, and if he ever did connect he always knew he'd done it and you know he didn't really need too much telling off he was he was a good guy really he was just a bit of a bit of a playboy but he had a bit of boy in him oh yes definitely 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 did you ride him out as well no he was a bit a bit strong for me so um donna rode him out a lot particularly before his um second hennessy winner and um yeah um nick child who used to look after C corto star he rode him a bit and harry skeltman he was here as well so yeah when you're a, when you're a last in, in a yard how close is the bond that you develop with the horses you look I think after. it's very close. You have to try and not let yourself get too close because obviously they're not your horses, but you know, you deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis and you see their good days and their bad days and and you of course you, you develop a really strong bond with them. So yeah, it's um it's quite you get quite close to them in the end. You you would have celebrated many good days with him, but also he had uh, quite a serious issue with his yes, heart. Yeah. And I imagine you were dealing with him day to day when he yeah. was recovering from the uh, that was that was quite difficult to see um you know, he, when he first um, was diagnosed and he, he, you know, he went up to Newmarket and he had this treatment, which is quite, it's quite a struggle, you know, it's quite harsh for them. And he came back and he, it took him a while to get over it. And, but it just, I think it's testament that shows he was made of steel, you know. He came back and he won another Hennessy and he, he, he took it all on the chin, as it were. You know, he's, he's, it, was, it was a harsh treatment, but he, he pulled it, he, he did his best for us and he came out of it so well. And... He just shows how brave he was, I think. Did you see, when you were dealing with him, when he was recovering from that, that he'd lost that sort of spark for a period of his yeah, life? Yeah, I mean, he always... It was still bright in his eye, but, you know, he looked a bit dull in his coat for a while and a bit skinny, and he it took a while to almost rebuild him. And, you know, obviously, with Paul and Clifford and everyone all together, it was a huge team effort to get him back to as good as he was, so... And was there a moment in his box or out of a morning when you thought, right, the Denman that I knew before the, the injury and before the illness is, is back? I think there was one morning, um, it was after he'd run at Kempton and he'd been beaten by Madison de Burley and Jess, um, who used to look after him, she'd had a baby and she came back to ride out part-time and she did a piece of work on him and she pulled up and I was down there on a different horse and she looked at Paul and she said, he's back. And, and that was, we all got excited again and, you know, we thought, right, come on, roll on Cheltenham. And he ran a cracking race that day. I mean, he, he came up against Corto Star, who was in the form of his life that day. So to finish within, I think, seven lengths, I think he finished within, um, close to him, it was a great achievement and just shows how tough he was. What, what made him so good in your eyes? I think it was just his sheer gutsiness. He never knew when to give up and he'd, he'd, give, he'd give his all for you. And it was just, it was a joy to watch him gallop and jump and just eat up the fences and eat up the ground. And he just, he knew how to rise to the occasion as well. He, he loved it at the festival and he was, 
he'd, he'd get there and you know you'd feel him grow a bit as he walked into into the parade ring when there was when there was a huge crowd there he loved it he loved the attention so I think that's what made him a real star. Is it is it hard when you, after a long period of time looking after a horse, when they go and into their retirement, which we, we hear is, is very happy for them, but is it tough to lose a horse like that? It, it's mixed feelings. It's bittersweet. You know, he's enjoyed a great. You've enjoyed a great career with him, and he's had a. But you know what he's going to do next is right for him, and you can wave him off with a with a happy smile and know that he's going to do something that he's going to love, and he's going to be really well looked after. And I think that's that's what was. Um, was great to see because it's so important for racehorses to be able to go and do something like that afterwards and to have such a nice home and you know Charlotte's had all right she had a really unfortunate time with him this summer but he's come through that now and he, he had, she had a great a great season hunting him last and she's done a great job with him so it's just fantastic to see pictures of him and to get email updates from her and it's I'm so pleased he's just have he's being enjoyed and so it's you do good. get constant updates and people yeah, keep in the loop? Yeah, Charlotte emails the office and sends pictures and it's, it's great. It's just great to hear from him, really. So, I know it sounds daft saying to hear from him, but, you know, yeah. via her. But, no, it's nice to hear from him. How would you sum him up dealing with him day in, day out in five words? That's a difficult one. Um, <laughs> well, he's tough and gutsy, so he's his two words, and good-looking boy and a bit of a playboy and just a superstar. Horse of a lifetime. Well, thanks to Ollie, I managed to catch up with then Paul Nichols' assistant, Dan Skelton. Your first memories of the day that Demon walked into the yard? Um, they're a little bit hazy, to be honest with you, because on a day like that, you're getting so many horses in. But yeah, he was obviously a winning Irish point to point, a big, strong type of horse. He lived in the field just behind the stables there at uh, Manor Farm Stables, next door to Paul Barber's house. and. Um, just a very exciting horse from a great family who'd done nothing wrong. So, um, it, when, physically, when you saw him the first time, you just thought, well, he's big. And then when he started to go into his work, did things really start to pick up from there on in terms of his talent and what you hoped for him? Um, when you talk in terms of hope, really, it was a blank canvas. You know, he, he, there was n no gold cups in mind or anything like that at that time. He was just a nice young horse who, who you know, had the world at his feet and would be taken gently. So, yeah, towards the end of his career, Paul always, and everyone always spoke about what a lazy character he was at home, but in those early, in that early year, I think he was a bit sort of sharper than he, he was as he got older and more used to his surroundings. But, um, yeah, he was a laid-back horse, especially in his stable. Um, got a bit moody at times, that never changed. Um, and his ability, as he got fitter, obviously you could see he had more, more ability than, than was average. Um, and he used to really fly down the flat gallop there. Um, really, you, you couldn't actually pull him up. I remember Christian Williams rode him the majority of the time uh, when he did his work, um, just because he'd basically run off with everybody else. And um, I had the pleasure of riding him a few times. I was in control for probably about 50% of those times. <laughs> um, but he was just an awesome beast. He had a huge stride. Um, when you rode him, the best way to describe it was almost like he, he, he had self-imposed blinkers on. He just put his head down and just ran. Um, and he was like that on the gallops as well. Uh, but he was a super, super horse. Well, the man who rode Denman to success in more races than any other jockey was Ruby Walsh. We managed to catch a word. Denman as a horse was a um, big, strapping individual. Um, very strong, very powerful. Big hind quarters, very strong neck. Um, at times he was an easy ride, at times he was a difficult ride. Um, you know, he, I suppose in latter years he was, he was called a tank and got flagged to be a stayer, but he was never actually that slow. Um, he won a two mile novice chase in Exeter one time. He had plenty of pace, he had great athleticism. Um, you know, and all his novice career, and even early as a chaser, he was unbelievable to get in close to a fence, the distance he could get out the back of it. He had great use of himself. He was very well muscled, very well conditioned. Um, had a fair old jaw on him at times. He'd, he could hang off right or hang off left. Um, you know, when he won the Challow on him, he hung right. When Christian Williams won him in Canton the first time, he hung left. Um, you know, there was a, always a quirk in him. He didn't take you to the tape and jump off. He was lazy about lining up. But when you got him going, he had an unbelievable engine. I suppose what made Denman so special was his ability to sustain 
a huge gallop. He could go so fast and keep it up for so long that he just killed horses off behind him. It, 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 you never thought going out and he was going to miss. So it didn't matter how fast you were going, he was going to get off the ground and land running. But he could just go <coughs> so fast for so long. I mean, that's one of the reasons he didn't win the, Supre the Supreme Novices Hurdle. I didn't go fast enough on him. At the time, I didn't trust him enough, and I made that mistake on him, and he got beaten by a horse in all meads. But the following year in the Sunner Lions chase, I let him roll along, sent him off the top of the hill, he pinged the third last, and he won as far as he wanted. Um, Sam Thomas rode him the same way in, a, in a, the following year's Hennessy and in the Gold Cup. Now, I went steady on to win in Leperstown, and he still had the speed to quicken up and beat Moss, Moss Bank. But um, his ability to just gallop and jump was phenomenal. For me, Denman's greatest performance, I didn't even ride him. <laughs> it was his Gold Cup. Um, I followed him in Cato Star, and it was the day I realised how did I not know that horse was so good? Um, he just jumped out and went in a Gold Cup, and when most horses would be steady in a fraction to give them get a lung full of air, Denman just cranked it up another notch and disappeared into the distance. It was an end to end exhibition. Um, I was sorry for a good while I hadn't ridden him, but I was definitely in awe of what he'd done. The man who rode him that day, Sam Thomas, joins us. Now, that was a wonderful afternoon. It was a moment in history. Yeah, um, it was incredible, wasn't it? I mean, there was so much hype before the race um, about who was who was best, this lad or, or Corto. And that you know, made it such a, such a great race. It got all the kind of racing public involved. Because um, they'd never ridden a, a race against each other, which mm. was the most amazing thing. Um, so it was a special day, a special day. It brings back good, good memories thinking about it now, and to just even be with him now is really nice. And a bit like the, the Hennessy, he was a sort of horse that you could ride almost with complete confidence. Was that, was that the feeling that he always gave you? Yeah, he was very reliable, really. The, the biggest problem you had sometimes was getting him to jump off at the start of a race. I remember mm. when I rode him at Newbury that time, and Ruby said to me, um, you know, make sure he jumps off, because he can just plant himself at the mm. start. So that was all pretty much I had to worry about. Once you got him going, you know, yeah, all you had to do then was keep a lid on him for as long as he could because um, when he got into a rhythm, he took some stopping. And as at Newbury, I remember being in the stands right opposite the water jump circuit to go, you, you yeah. took it up. It was the same at Cheltenham. Again, it was quite an aggressive ride. Yeah, but at the same time, that's kind of the way he enjoyed being ridden, really. Um, you know, he loved being handy and jumping well from the front. And there's no point stopping him doing that because he's just wasting his attributes, really. He jumps so well, travels so strongly, and it just made it difficult for the horses to, to lay up at that sort of speed. So it'd be silly not to let him get on with it, really. Um, and it's not an intentional way to ride him, but it's just, you know, sometimes you know, look at the size of him, you haven't got much choice. <laughs> and that feeling when you stood up in the irons going past the winning post? Um, but Newbury, I couldn't quite believe it, really, because he's the best horse I'd ever ridden, really. Mm. And it's difficult to kind of comprehend how a horse can win such a a big race so easily really so I couldn't quite believe it and then obviously after having a bit more to do with him you know we really appreciated how good he was and even at the Gold Cup to be fair you know I still couldn't believe I'd won even crossing the line really it was uh, took a while to sink in so um, yeah fantastic memories and I'm just so grateful I've had yeah you know been able to be associated with the horse. What sort of character? Well now he's pretty chilled out really but I remember especially you know, when he was at his best and his peak fitness, he was so grumpy all the time. Um, you know, you go and tack him up and you have to watch your fingers. Um, but, you know, he's just an ultimate professional, really. He's always got on with his work and I think he's really enjoying himself with Charlotte now and doing different things, messing around, and you can see how nice and chilled out he is now. So he's getting the retirement that he deserves. Charlotte, what was it like that first day when you got the phone call from Paul Nichols? It was terribly exciting. It was mm. amazing because I'd just lost my old horse, Earth Mover who'd died and I'd had him for a long time. He came from Paul's yard and it, it was just out of the blue and I just couldn't believe that they would entrust me with such an amazing horse. And Paul said he wanted him to go hunting and team chasing and do everything that Earth Mover did and have an active retirement. And it was fantastic. Um, what was the sort of process of rehabilitating him outside of a, a racing regime? He he had a tendon injury mm. about a year before, so he had a year off. So we had to do a lot of flat work with him and get him fit slowly. And then I had to teach him to go across country, mm. through gates, across stinging nettles, through little fords, into fields of sheep. He stood straight up the first time he went into a field of sheep, didn't know what they were. <laughs> and, um, and he's learnt from there, then little hunt jumps and jumping around the farm. And 
he's come on so well and it's just little bits at a time and he then I took him hunting and he absolutely loves hunting he roared off with me the first time mm. I had him he is quite strong and then he settled and he is absolutely amazing he's a proper hunter and he jumps rails walls hedges he's absolutely brilliant and he'll be at the front and he'll be showing the best of them he i mean i, I used to see him down at, at ditch it um, i wouldn't have got a pull of anywhere near his mouth back then but now he'll take them quite happily he seems a, a quite a, a chilled out laid back dude has that been a an evolution has he relaxed into to your environment i, th I think that's the case and one-to-one -one, I, I look after them myself and he's not as fit as he would have been when he was in racing. He's not in a buzzy racing yard. As you know, it's very quiet here. And it's, I do everything to them. So mm. he's, he's very chilled and it's a, a, a very easy environment for him to be in. It's not all been plain sailing, of course. He had the fibrillating heart, didn't he? Uh, of course, after he won his Gold's Cup and before his second Hennessy had the tendon injury before. And then another hurdle to overcome. Tell us about that. Well, it was absolutely awful actually he I found him lame in the field when I got back from work got the vet out he then had to have two flushes of the fetlock because it kept infecting we then sent him down to Newmarket to Ian Wright at Newmarket Equine Hospital and he then had um, an operation on the pastum bone to remove that because that was infected and no one knows the causes of why the wherefores that's the worst thing you don't know why it happened it just happened and he spent about four or five months in Newmarket at Quine Hospital. He was about to come home and then he couldn't because he reinfected got a sort of blood disorder. And they were amazing down there. Mm. I mean, Ian and his team were absolutely unbelievable. I mean, he would have been dead if he was any of my other horses. And Paul Barber would not give up on him. He said to me, Charlotte, as long as it's humane to keep, you know, for the, him to have the treatment, as long as he's taking the treatment, I will not give up on him and look at him now i mean this is a miracle it's absolutely amazing what's happened that this horse as you've seen him today cantering about mm. jumping and we've got the go ahead to sort of crack on properly in march and he's just going to be normal which is absolutely amazing um, i suppose that just sums him up we saw it on track and now we're we're seeing it in real life as well a warrior yes he's so brave and he fought his illness with such bravery mm. and courage that he showed in his Hennessy and Gold Cup wins. I mean, he had to fight it with that because he wouldn't have been survived it or be here today without his sort of want, will to live and will to do it. And it's a credit to him. And the future for you and for Dem, and you become real pals. You can see there's a bond <laughs> between you. Yes, I'm. This summer, I'm going to get him more schooled get get all the training in and then lots of hunting we'll, we'll do a little bit at the end of this season lots of hunting next season and we'll take it from there maybe a bit of team chasing see how he goes and tell us a, a bit about his daily routine these days he's in at night he goes out during the day gets ridden in the mornings and he's really relaxed and he'll go hunting so once or twice a week when he's back in hunting mode and He's, he won't have as much food as when he was in training and he's not doing the same, going up the same gallop. So everything is different. The exercising is all different. We go out in the woods through there or we're going to the park where we've just been or up the hills. We'll round up the sheep and he loves it. It's all different and it means it's not such the same thing day in, day out for them. And they're not on as much food either as they would be in training. And he's, what is he, just turned 14? 14. Is that right? Now, Earth Mover, um, who came from the same stable, you were still jumping seven foot hedges and ditches with him well into his 20s. Yes, yes. He was an unbelievable horse and he was competing at top level, age 21. So there's no reason why Denman shouldn't. And uh, if I get him trained up enough, he will be absolutely amazing. Star he is. What a star and a legend, mm. too. Yes, and he just loves his new job, loves hunting. The big man's gone to bed, Denman's away to sleep, and it's time for us to hit the roads and hit the pillow as well. I hope you've enjoyed this Denman special on the latest edition of This Racing Life. Bye for now.